In 2013, you might have seen Kai Lawrence McGilvery online yourself. A news interview he was in actually went so viral, he ended up on the Jimmy Kimmel show and was getting scouted by PR representatives to start shooting a reality show. But do you know how crazy this story gets? There's so much more to it than the meme of Kai going smash, smash, smash. He literally ends up on trial for murder. My name is Mac, and let's dig into this Killer Bites episode together. In his viral video, Kai describes rescuing a woman in Fresno from a man who was going insane behind the wheel. He was hitchhiking a ride from a stranger named Jet McBride, who Kai who said went crazy during their trip. Kai's hitchhike erupted in chaos pretty quickly. The driver said he could get away with any crime because he was the second coming of Jesus. Then Kai said the guy confessed to taking the advantage of a 14-year-old girl while he was in the Virgin Islands once on a business trip and never got caught. Then he said the man snapped completely, went on a racist tirade, and just drove the car into the back of a garbage truck. They hit a black pedestrian who was crossing the road too. Someone was now pinned between their car and the truck they hit while Kai was sitting in the back seat. Witnesses rushed to help right away, but the belligerent driver got out and started attacking bystanders. So Kai ran up behind him with a hatchet and hit him three times over the head. Once the police took over the scene, a local Fresno news station, Fox 26, started doing interviews. People kept recalling a homeless hitchhiker who had rescued them all, so they found the unlikely hero on the side of the road and talked to him about his horrifying experience on camera. They uploaded his interview to YouTube and the rest was internet history, or so we thought. Kai described himself as a home free, but the 24 year old hadn't had one for a long time. He crashed where he could for the night. He did what he had to just to get by. Sometimes when he had nowhere else to go, he'd stay in the company of older men. One of these men, a 73 year old named Joseph Galfi, would be found dead at home in his underwear. But it was clear to police that he didn't go peacefully in his sleep or anything like that. He'd been beaten to death by an unknown assailant and only found days later by a neighbor after Joseph failed to show up for work at his own law firm. Police didn't have much to go on, except a note that Joseph had made to himself that brought a twist of fate to this whole case that the public never saw coming. The name Kai Lawrence written above a phone number on a notepad hidden underneath Joseph's laptop. Kai spent the months after his video popped off in California. Since he was so transient, the Fox 26 anchor who interviewed him had leveraged his way into being his sole business contact, managing the entertainment contracts flying Kai's way from Los Angeles. The anchor jumped on the opportunity and lined up a second interview, and Kai didn't shy away from his sordid past this time. He was running from a dark childhood in Alberta, Canada, where he said his mother would lock him in his room where the windows were covered in sheets for days at a time. She eventually put him in the foster system after he was caught trying to start a fire in his home. He wrote songs and learned to play the guitar while getting shuffled through the foster care system, but by his 18th birthday, he was already drifting. He felt alone in the world, and he made his way in the world alone. Kai was still more vulnerable with the media vultures, who were now pinning after him and revealed he'd been sexually assaulted more than once, even having to fight off a predator himself while living on the street. But his new PR team didn't publicize that interview. They instead tried their hardest to pivot him towards the story that the world was familiar with. A young, fancy-free, nomadic hippie who rescued innocent people, from a racist would-be spree killer. So they laid the Kai a room at the Roosevelt Hotel, a place where the Academy Awards originally began, after he got booked as a guest on the Jimmy Kimmel Show in Hollywood. But if you thought that the 20-something homeless hitchhiker without a social security number, driver's license passport, or any other identification who became famous for his silly description of bashing someone's head in with a hatchet was going to be consistent, hardworking, entertainment, personality, right for long-term investment overnight, maybe you could land a big job in Hollywood. But you'll have to guess again. After he signed his new TV deal and unidentifiable hieroglyphics, his new PR team found him outside peeing on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in broad daylight. When they rushed him into the hotel room, they say that he helped himself to the minibar right away and chugged a liter of few minutes. Before long, the entire crew had been ejected from the hotel after Kai started skateboarding through the bar in the lobby. It was then that the Keeping Up With Her Kardashians brand manager Lisa Samsky first wondered if she and her colleagues were in danger. Kai was unpredictable, and as they chased him through the boutique shops and cafes of Hollywood, they truly felt he was capable of anything. His family members have since illuminated his propensity for violence and fits of rage. His cousin said he honestly disbelieves Caleb has mental issues because he seems well, but when it comes to a certain pressure, you either become a diamond or you get crushed. And Caleb gets crushed. Maybe the pressure was too high for Kai when he urinated publicly again in the Jimmy Kimmel parking lot, or when Kimmel gave him a personal gift of $500, which Kai promptly gave up to the parking lot bouncer, as in, 
apology for relieving himself at his security gate. Whatever the reason, Kai's antisocial antics didn't stop the Hollywood people from finally getting him onto Kimmel. It was the police that did that. And while Kai and his team waited in the green room moments before he was meant to go on national TV, the police intercepted him. He was wanted for further questioning. Okay, they still let him go on Kimmel and waited until he was done to talk to him, but they probably shouldn't have. Jimmy Kimmel did a good job deflecting Kai's strange humor and the weird tendency he would go on, but Kai didn't exactly play the simple character Hollywood wanted. And when he was done, they handed him over to the Fresno police for further questioning about the incident. Turns out Kai had been boasting about his heroism during a gig and his new band was doing, and someone was paying close attention to the story than he was. Apparently Justin Bieber's production team had been asking around for him since the video, so Kai's PR team sent him up with the first band they could find playing in Fresno. Kai bragged before a gig with this new band about how the other couldn't handle his he passed the driver a joint before the incident at the intersection. The lead guitarist of his new band listened as Kai went on to say the driver didn't even know that this shoe was laced, referring to the practice of mixing other drugs like into cannabis and joint like cocaine or even bath salts. A follow-up with Fresno police confirmed that Kai and Jet McBride had smoked in the car immediately before the incident. Kai actually instigated it himself by telling the driver that they were both ghosts, and he bet that they could drive through the truck right now and nobody would see them. So when authorities in New Jersey called Fresno PD after they obtained CCTV footage of the murdered attorney Joseph Galfi buying Kai a train ticket in the days before his death, investigators wouldn't settle for Kai's tall tales like Hollywood did. They tracked him down at another train station in Philadelphia, still drifting three months after going viral. With the circumstantial evidence piled all around him, Kai was one of the last people to see Joseph Galfi alive, but he didn't confess to murder. Kai told police that Joseph had taken him to dinner in Times Square before they went back to his home in New Jersey. He'd offered to let Kai stay there for the night, but when he woke up in the morning, he realized that the man had taken advantage of him in his sleep. But Kai told police that he'd decided not to do anything. This corroborated the hug Kai had given Joseph, which they'd seen on the CCTV from the train station, but it didn't explain how Joseph ended up dead. He'd reached out to Joseph again that night when an arrangement he'd made with a fan for accommodation fell through. Joseph picked him up and they had dinner with a couple of drinks again at his place before Kai describes waking up again with without knowing where he was. He found himself on the floor where Joseph was trying to pull his pants down, and he fought Joseph off in self-defense. Without any defensive marks, wounds, or signs of a struggle, police found his story hard to swallow. Joseph's friends and family likewise testified to his character, and of course you never know what kind of skeleton someone can have in their closet. But Joseph's injuries were particularly brutal. The hardest bones in Joseph's face had been broken, and chunks of the septuagenarian flesh had landed on the ground around his corpse during the attack. Kai had embraced Joseph and asked to stay for a second time, at his home and he cuts his long hair and fled the state after Joseph's murder. Prosecutors didn't buy self-defense at all and brought forward first-degree murder charges against him. Kai Lawrence would wait almost five years for his murder trial and in 2019 he was found guilty. The judge chastised personally during sentencing calling him a powder keg of explosive rage and that he'd created this public image of a free spirit but underneath that free spirit the jury saw another side of you a cold bloody calculated callous killer. Well, I'm not sure if I could put it better myself, but I wonder how far Kai's case might have escalated if the media wasn't so overexcited to propagate Kai's mask of innocence for the fame and the riches. Kai always repeated that everyone is worthy of love, no matter what they've done. I don't know if he believed that sincerely or because he had to, but I'm Mac and I love you for watching Killer Bites, so thank you so much and take care of yourself.